but the consul's brow was sad, and the consul's speech was low, and darkly looked he at the wall, and darkly at the foe. Their van will be upon us before the bridge goes down, and if they once may win the bridge, what hope to save the town? Then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate, to every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can men die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? Hello, and welcome to Bloody Violent History. My name is Tom Ashton, and with my old friend James Jackson, we're going to talk about moments from history that tell us who we are, how we got here, and perhaps where we're heading. And it's often violent and generally quite bloody. If this were a movie, I would be declaiming, Today is our famous last stand day. From ancient times to the modern era, wide political and military events are often recalled by one or other mad moments. Who remembers the Zulu Wars without Rourke's Drift, or the Sioux War without Custer's last stand at Little Bighorn? It's about being in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong enemy. It's a byword for courage and defiance, and often a total miscalculation. Our heroes might be hacked to bits, disemboweled and scalped, but they attain immortality in our memories. Jamie, where do we start? Oh, we have to start with Thermopylae, Tom, the, the great stand by the Spartans in 480 BC. And they stood against the Persian army. The army of Xerxes was, at some estimates, put it at 250,000. The Spartans, by that stage, had only sent 300 up from Sparta because it was a religious holiday at the time and they didn't want to anger the gods. So there were the 300 Spartans. They had 700 Thespians. They had people from Thebes. They had a bunch of helots, their slaves. The force in total, when they got there, was about 5,000. But Leonidas, the king, one of the two kings of Sparta, sent most of them away because he didn't want them to be slaughtered. He wanted them to be able to fight a second day. So the actual stand at Thermopylae, which means hot gates, as it was known as, because there are hot springs there and sulfur coming out from the cracks, uh, there were about 1,500 standing there uh, with the Spartans in the lead. And this is all what we might term a higher cause, a cause of loyalty and honour. Yes, this is really our first section, a higher cause, or absolutely crass stupidity, some would say, <laughs> quite often. Nothing wrong with that. No, well, indeed. And quite often, you, you mentioned miscalculation, and quite often it's miscalculation on both sides because the bigger enemy quite often underestimates what the smaller enemy, those who are cornered, will actually do. And Xerxes had built this massive pontoon across the Hellespont, about two miles, made from ships, had taken his entire army across and was marching down Greece. No one had got their act together among the Greek states, apart from really the Spartans, who took their force up there, ready to make a stand. And that was the obvious location in which to block the advance. Xerxes came not only with a huge army from all parts of his Persian empire. I mean, there were Phoenicians in, in his navy, there were Egyptians, there were Indians, there were, you name it. They, they, they were all part of Xerxes' massive army. And, and they weren't, I mean, the Phoenicians, for instance, weren't incompetent. They were extremely competent. Were incredibly they? competent, very good fighters. Um, they were, in fact, invading Sicily at the time as well, so no one came to the aid of Greece at that time. The other problem with what was going on in Greece is that so many of the city-states actually sided with Xerxes. They knew which side their bread was buttered. They didn't want to be on the losing side. And they knew that Xerxes had come to essentially slaughter the Athenians and the Spartans, who had shown disrespect and either turned the ambassadors of Persia away or killed them, as the Spartans had done. So Xerxes was really back for revenge and back to complete unfinished business. And the Spartans weren't that popular. I mean, they were a rough crew, weren't they, oh, in Greece in Greece itself? Oh, they were a very rough crew, and they had 
dominated the areas around Sparta. They had enslaved so many people and turned them into helots. They, they quarreled with everyone. But then everyone in Greece quarreled with everyone else. But people forget how small the numbers were. I mean, if you look at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, you know, the numbers involved and the numbers on the Greek side who were killed, there were only 192 Greeks killed at Marathon, and yet we remember it as the great battle. There's probably more Marathon runners who've died since then, <laughs> <laughs> just from yeah. running that damn race. Yes, the 26 miles between Marathon and Athens that the... Athenian army had to march back to Athens extremely quickly to try and defend the place. Uh, is that where the 20s... Because the actual distance the guy who took the message had to run was a lot further. Yes, the, what Philippides did carrying the message and, and this this myth of him dying at the end of it and that becoming the marathon is an untrue. It's, it's actually... Uh, Philippides also took messages to Sparta as well. So he, he did a lot of running. But the actual marathon race is really based on the... Greek army moving back from Marathon after the battle back to Athens and that's the distance and by then 6,000 plus Persians were dead so Xerxes was back to as I said complete unfinished business he had no intention of being held up by this group that lay in front of him. So the actual battle what, what, how does it uh, work out? Well this was August 480 BC, and the Greek fleet was also uh, in the Straits. It was across in Euboea, uh, waiting for the Persian fleet, um, mostly actually manned by Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were very good seafarers. So they knew they were up against it. I mean, the Athenians didn't really have a lot of background in their triremes. They had gone through a crash course in rowing and fighting at sea, and this was the idea of Themistocles, the great politician of his day in Athens. But it was pretty controversial because a lot of Athenians wanted to fight on land. That was their preferred approach to defeating the Persians. But Themistocles had skewed it towards the fleet. So you've got the Spartans up at the hot gates, up at Thermopylae. It's a, a pass, really, that at its narrowest is only about one wagon wide. And what the Spartans did and the forces with them did was base themselves at the middle gate, which is about 60 foot wide, and there was a, a shallow wall there right in the middle, and Leonidas, the king, the leader of his band, his merry band, uh, rebuilt it. So it was basically his hoplites, his Spartans, who were all cased in bronze, uh, bronze helmets and bronze shields and carrying their spears and swords, um, behind this shallow wall and they waited for the Persian army to advance and quite often in those sort of situations a restricted constrained place is very difficult for a large army they can't maneuver they can't use their archers they can't use cavalry so the advantage actually lay with the Spartans at that stage. And was bronze the sort of top technical kit that they had to fight with in, the, in those times? Yes, it was the Bronze Age, but the Persian army, the levies who led the attack right at the start, uh, they carried wicker shields. So it's a bit like stone, paper, scissors. You see your wicker shield being cut to pieces and you know you're in trouble. And the Spartans were just born killers. They were trained right from the start to fight and to kill. They were very, very good at it. And at Marathon and other battles, they had this great capacity to faint and pretend to run and then turn and just cut down anyone who was pursuing them. They were very disciplined. They kept in their phalanx rank and they all depended on each other. But it would have been extremely hot, unpleasant work. And as the dead mounted up after the first day, the smell and the stench would have been terrifying. The main part of the Battle of Thermopylae lasted two and a half days. For two days, the Spartans and their allies, 1,500 of them in total, because Leonidas, as I said, has sent the rest of the army back, held out and did extremely well. And Leonidas replaced the front ranks on a rotor system so the others could go back. 
the Spartans had a particular way of approaching uh, battle. You know, the, beforehand they'd sit there combing their hair. I mean, the Persians couldn't believe it when their ambassadors turned up, their envoys turned up to try and get the Spartans to surrender. And they just found the Spartans ignoring them and combing their hair. And if they were combing their hair, what were the thespians doing? Well, <laughs> overacting. Well, I always think that in the middle of the battle you could probably hear, what is the motivation? <laughs> And make it so, and then at the other end you'd hear, hello, hobbits, <laughs> and then probably a few drama students. I think knight knighthoods all round. <laughs> yes, 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 and then, and then a few drama students at the front confounding the enemy by pretending to hatch out of an egg. Yeah. Uh, who and, knows? And, and no doubt giving their political uh, views as well. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. But it, it was an incredible battle, and the, the Persians were slaughtered, I mean, in huge numbers. But then, of course... As we all know, every gorge, every valley has tracks uh, on the heights of the mountains around, and this is exactly what happened. They were betrayed. It's said that Leonidas might have led a Cryptia squad, an assassination squad, to try and kill uh, the Persian king Xerxes in his massive tent, but no one quite knows, and uh, it's probably unlikely that... Leonidas and his team would have got through the Persian lines. And, I mean, here they'd that. have to get past thousands of immortal guards, like the Praetorian guards. Yes, and the immortals were extremely good soldiers. Xerxes was surrounded by his, uh, his key Praetorians, the key immortals, who all carried gold pommel spears. The, the, the butt of the spear was a gold apple, whereas the shock troops of his immortals carried silver spears, had mm. silver apples on the end. I and always find, you know, fighting with a gold apple, apple pommeled sword works so much better. Yes, you still look like an ass <laughs> if you're killed. You, you very much feel like you're <laughs> top of the tree. Yeah, 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 and it doesn't fall very far from that tree. Yeah, yeah, right. but, the, the, but anyway, Xerxes sent... 10,000 of his immortals to follow this traitor, this local. You know, so many of the local city-states and tribes did not support the defence, the Spartan defence against Xerxes. And so many of them were on the side of the Persians. So what happened, the immortals went up these tracks, they climbed for four hours, they went through across a plateau, they went through oak woods, they surprised a bunch of Phosian guards who were actually allies. There were 1,000 of them supposedly ranged on the tracks above to help the Spartans plug that particular gap in their defences. They surprised a few, they killed them, and then went down the other side. This was on the third day. And it, when the Spartans awoke... They knew that they were surrounded, and it's always said, Herodotus reports that Leonidas said to his men, eat, eat a good breakfast, because tonight we dine in the underworld. So they knew where it was going. They were surrounded, the Persians close in, the Thespians and the Spartans uh, fight extremely bravely. Some Thespians surrendered, none of the Spartans surrendered. Out of the 300, 298 actually were killed, including Leonidas, because uh, two of them were sent on other missions or were blinded earlier and had to withdraw. And one of them who withdrew, having been blinded, was then branded a coward by Sparta until he then redeemed himself a year later in the battle against the Persians, where he was the first person to die, actually. So... The, the Spartans were wiped out. They had managed to hold the pass for two and a half days. Leonidas's head is put on a stake in the road as the Persian army marched by, and that is Thermopylae. But it has become such a symbol of resistance and something that allowed the Athenians a bit of time to get more of their people across to the island of Salamis to evacuate Athens. And it was these battles that were key, really, to our being democracies today in the West. I mean, this is what allowed Athenian democracy to survive, the sort of resistance that was put up at Thermopylae. Excellent. So how does this Greek-Persian war end? There were several stages to it, Tom. The, one of the first stages, of course, was the Athenians evacuating to Salamis across the strait. And they all waited at Salamis with the uh, 
Athenian fleet of 200 triremes, their rowing galleys and other Greek galleys, waiting for the Persian fleet and the Phoenicians to come and wipe them out. So there was Xerxes sitting on his throne above the Straits of Salamis, having taken Athens and set fire to it and destroyed temples and carried off a lot of bronzes and statues and everything else. And he wanted this to be the icing on the cake, the destruction of the Athenian and wider Greek fleet. So his triremes come in and the Athenians attack and they absolutely smash the fleet of Xerxes. So it's a catastrophe and it's that moment, that moment that could have been a last stand for the Athenians in Salamis and it would have been the the end of the Athenian adventure basically, the end of the Athenian experiment and democracy because they would have been enslaved or killed. But their fleet saves them. It gives Xerxes' fleet such a drubbing which has already suffered terribly from storms. I mean there was one flotilla of 200 ships of Xerxes that was completely destroyed by a storm earlier and another battle in which they were badly mauled as well. So that's the point where Xerxes thinks, well, I'm not going to be able to take Salamis. He starts trying to build uh, another pontoon as he did across the Hellespont, across the gap to Salamis. But the Greek triremes attack that, firing arrows, killing the people building it. And so that can't be done either. That is the moment where Xerxes decides to retreat. So he he heads back home and leaves his cousin and brother-in-law, work out the inbreeding arrangement there, Hmm. to basically finish the task. So Merodius, his general he leaves behind, Uh, waits till the following year and pulls his army together and begins to advance. But this time, the Greek army come together, the city-states come together, and they reckon that up to 40,000 Greeks are in this army. It's huge compared to what Greek forces are normally like. I mean, at one point, when uh, Sparta sends 5,000 troops up to join the fray in in the battle. At the point where the Spartans send 5,000 men up to the Battle of Plate, which is 479 BC, the one in which Merodius is killed and the Persians are seriously routed, 5,000 men, that's about three quarters of Sparta's manpower, adult manpower, So you can see these are tiny numbers involved. So 40,000 men sent up to do battle against the Persians. It's a lot. The battle hung in the balance. At one point, the Greeks were almost encircled and cut off, but they managed to go forward. You know, it was the habit of the Greek hoplites to move forward, go on the offensive, and it succeeded, and... That was the end of the Persians, their cavalry, their infantry. The day was won for for Greece and for Athens in particular. Um, Okay. well, before we go on to other battles, I mean, there's a lot of detail in that. But was the last stand at Thermopylae an important tactical or strategic moment to the ultimate destruction of the Persians? Or was it more of a PR uh, thing that we still enjoy to this day? I think it was both. I I think it showed what could be done by brave men. It showed that it was right to stand up to invasion. I think it showed that Sparta was quite prepared to take the lead and sacrifice itself for a cause, for the higher cause, the higher good. I think that sent a message to the rest of Greece and certainly those in the Peloponnese who had rather dug up the roads and the causeways and the links to their parts of Greece, uh, not wanting to be invaded, they suddenly thought, well, actually, Sparta's taken a stand. We really need to fight our corner. We need to contribute. Certainly after Thermopylae and what had happened at Salamis, that was the beginning of the turning of the tide. And so it's important. And that's why it's our starting point, because I said it's, it's where democracy survived. It's where that experiment Uh, prevailed. And it just shows that not only do you have to have a belief in your political system, you have to be willing to fight for it as well. Another great example of 
famous last stands in the ancient world is the Siege of Masada, 72 to April 73 AD. Yes, that came in the middle of the Jewish revolt. And you know, when you go to Masada today, it gives you an idea of the extraordinary task, the amazing last stand it was. I love the place. I don't, I've never understood why it's not one of the seven wonders of the world. It's, it's just extraordinary. It was where Herod the Great built a palace, uh, not only on the top of this sort of plateau of this mountain, but it's also vertical. It's clinging to the sides. It had sort of hanging gardens and hanging buildings. It's just amazing. And to, to sit on one of the boulders that the Jewish zealots, the Sicarii, were rolling down on the Roman legions, it just is so evocative. That was a very important battle because you had 9,000 armed Roman legionaries at the bottom uh, building a ramp to get to the top of this mountain. You had 960 Jewish zealots facing them down. It's an amazing place. The actual palace, the ruins of the palace, actually sh show that Herod had a swimming pool up there. So given there's no water on the top, the only way they could have got it there was to get slaves to bring it up there in pails or it's it's there's one track basically that can have one man at any one time going up it to the summit yeah it's an impressive looking place and we normally put a few pictures on our instagram account to uh, show some of these things so i'll put a picture of the masada it's very dramatic and it reminds me of the action by Britain's SAS in the late 1950s on the Jebel Akhtar in Oman when they went up to take on the rebels that were holding out against the then sultan. And they actually found steps cut in this rock, cut in this track, that had been put there by a Persian army that were attacking the Jebel 2,000 years before. So all these places that have held out, they're, they're, the people hold out there because they think it's impregnable, but ultimately they usually aren't. They're usually taken by surprise. But the, the, the Roman legion, the 10th legion, had to make incredible efforts to, to lay siege to Masada. Oh, amazing efforts. And if you go there today, you can actually see where the Roman camp was. And, and the ramp is still there as well. So it's a phenomenal place. And of course, it ended with the zealots up on the top deciding to kill themselves rather than suffer the ignominious fate of falling into Roman hands. And they probably would have been crucified, given that the Romans crucified about 10,000 people outside the walls of Jerusalem when Jerusalem was under siege. I mean, the Romans were not shy of extreme brutality and cruelty. They actually have tablets, clay tablets at Masada today, which supposedly... Uh, have the names of those who were drawing lots to kill each other. So, so Because it was against their religion to commit suicide. Yes, so they drew lots to decide who would kill the, the others, and that's what happened, and, and those clay tablets are still there. And actually, there's a synagogue up there, which I believe is one of the oldest synagogues in the world. It's, it's very ancient. So it's a very special site. They also held out in another extraordinary place called Herodium, where Herod the Great, who was a great builder and a bit of a megalomaniac and wanted to impress the Romans anyway, uh, he built his palace there, which is just a couple of miles from Bethlehem, uh, inside the crater of a hill. So you climb the side of the hill and you look down, and there are the ruins of his palace. And what's even more extraordinary, uh, he actually lived there. What's more extraordinary is you, you go down inside a building and you go down and down and down, past the water systems, go further and further and further down, and you come out of the bottom of the hill. It, it, you can imagine how many slaves must have been used to build this place. Yeah, it's it, an it, incredible it, looking place. It's yes. sort of like it's a true James Bond lair. Yes, that's the, fir lair. that's the first thing you think when you look down into this crater. It's so extraordinary, so peculiar. And the zealots held out there as well, and they were pacified uh, at around the same time as Masada. So they were coming out of the caves and the holes around that hill, around that small mountain, to attack the Romans as well. 
So those were real redoubts, real strong points. But eventually, the Romans got their ramp up, managed to put up a siege tower as well, rain arrows down, and that's when the zealots decided we've had enough. And and we know all this really because of what Josephus, who was a defector, uh, wrote. He's the single source really of what went on at Masada. And Masada wasn't discovered for centuries and, and was then stumbled upon. So, it, it, But it's it's a truly remarkable place. Okay, Jamie, that's great. Uh, There are many examples between ancient times and modern times. So let's jump into the modern era a bit bit closer to our own times and the famous Battle of the Alamo. Yes, the Alamo is a fantastic example of the higher cause. And the 19th century seems to have come up with a lot of that because it was at the time of nation-state building. So you always got... the the sort of friction and edges of empires and states clashing with each other and rubbing against each other and causing uh, these sort of small unit actions that occur all over the place. And the Alamo certainly is very evocative of that period of time. You know, as part of the Texas Revolt, you had Texans searching for independence against Mexico no one came to the aid of the Alamo. Uh, you know, no one in the rest of the United States really wanted to know. So, so the Texans put themselves forward to defend it. So in San Antonio, uh, the Spanish mission, the old Spanish mission there, it was Texans really who came forward to fight. Uh, those legendary names came forward to fight, like Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie. And William T- Travis. We can't forget him. He seems to get left out. Yes, we can't forget William Travis. And it was an amazing fight. It didn't last very long. The The siege, if you like, was really 13 days as the uh, Mexican forces under President Santa Ana came and encircled the place. And the final stage was really a one-day attack. And there was no way that this small mission was going to be able to hold out. The Mexicans are incredibly cruel. No quarter was given. It's rumoured that four or five Texans might have tried to surrender, but they were slaughtered. They chased the Texans into the interior, came up over the walls and scaling ladders. It was very brutal hand-to-hand fighting, and up to 200 Texans were killed, uh, including our heroes. It backfired badly. Again, it falls into this category of the attackers underestimating both the resistance of the defenders but also the longer-term PR situation, the longer-term effects, the psychological effects. What well, said so it really encouraged um, other Texans to sort of join join in the fight and, and led to the ultimate destruction of, of the Mexican army. Well, it was an iconic battle. A couple of months later, in April 1836, you get the Battle of Chiquinto, and that was when the Mexicans, again under Santa Ana, were defeated by the Texans. Santa Ana goes on the run, tries to get across Vince's Bridge, hides in the marshes, is captured, and then begs for his life and does a plea bargain, essentially, and tells the rest of the Mexican army to lay off. That's to stop him being hanged or shot, uh, which a lot of the Texans wanted, given his brutality at the Alamo. That is just one of the small unit actions, the Alamo, that really stands out from the 19th century. And it's an important battle, and it laid the foundation for an independent Texas and a Texas withdrawing from Mexican rule. And uh, also the tremendous reputation they still have today in Texas of producing military men. Yes, and it's it's been somewhat overtaken by the sort of Texan-Mexican war sort of 10 years later, but it still stands out as one of those key moments in history. Remember the Alamo. OK, well, uh, on from that, 1863, we have the Battle of Cameron. Yes, that was, again, involving the Mexicans. Uh, France had got involved in Mexico. They'd sent their French Foreign Legion. What happened at Cameron in this hacienda, this defence of this hacienda, uh, not only entered folklore, but actually is so important that uh, Captain Jean d'Anjou, who was killed during this 
firefight, essentially. He had a wooden hand, and it's now the most sacred relic, really, of the French Foreign Legion. It is carried on parade once a year. It was an amazing last stand because there were 65 of them in total, the French Foreign Legionnaires, three officers. And these French Foreign Legionnaires held out against 3,300 Mexicans, killed a hell of a lot of Mexicans. And the fighting was so fierce that at one stage the Mexicans said, uh, do you surrender? And there was a French sergeant who just went mad. And it's a bit like the Battle of the Bulge and the uh, American officer shouting nuts at the Germans. <laughs> it's the same defiance that you get in these situations. And, and, and the report and the Mexicans back to their general was, was, you know, that they were fighting not men, they were fighting demons. Yes, it was incredibly savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And the Mexicans had sent in cavalry, they had gunners there, they, they had everything they threw into the mix. And the legionnaires kept on holding out, were fighting in small groups by the end. I mean, there was one group who just fixed bayonets and charged, knowing that the end was coming. And by the end, the majority of the French foreign legionaries were dead. Yeah, and, and they were offered by the Mexicans three times they were offered to surrender, and each time they said no. Yes, and that included the officers and the men just said, no, we're not going to back down. And to think that they were simply there as a squad to defend the, the route that was being taken by a convoy carrying gold, and they knew that that convoy was going to be ambushed, so they, they decided to go on holding out. It's, it's an amazing feat of arms. Well, I'll put a picture of, of uh, Captain Danjou's wooden paw up on our Insta um, account. And um, I think, do they swear on it today? Is that the sort of thing they, they do? They certainly... Oh, oh, at the battle they swore on it, didn't they? They, you know, they swore that they were going to keep fighting. Yes, he was still alive at that stage and he made them uh, take an oath of fealty to fight to the death, just as he did. And they kept to that promise. I mean, by the end of the day, 43 of the French legionnaires were dead 17 were wounded, some of them extremely badly, and only two of them were captured because they had been surrounded and seized. But the fighting was all around by that stage. So it was an incredible battle, and it really goes down in history and should be known about more in the rest of the Western world. Excellent. Well, into the 20th century. To wrap up the, uh, the theme of a higher cause in famous last stands... Let's uh, leap forward to the Battle of Okinawa in the Second World War, 1945. Oh, Okinawa was, was a turning point for so many reasons. It was the most brutal, the most devastating of all the battles, I think, in the Pacific. I mean, the, the losses, the casualties were huge. I mean, by the end of it, I mean, apart from the 14,000 American dead, you had 77,000 Japanese soldiers dead, their high command there had killed themselves. There were 150,000 Japanese civilian casualties. I mean, by the end, because they were so brainwashed by Japanese propaganda, they were convinced they were going to be raped, brutalised, tortured by the Americans. So a lot of them, thousands of them, either killed themselves and their families with knives, with grenades. A lot of them were given grenades by the Japanese soldiers to kill themselves. Yeah, I mean, they were encouraged by the military to kill themselves. Yes, and they were surprised at how kind the Americans were to them when they, when they were actually captured. Yeah. And thousands of them, I mean, there were, there's footage of them jumping in droves off the southern cliffs of Okinawa. It was... It was it was like lemmings. Lemmings it was to the slaughter. Yeah. Terrifying. You know, this is really the battle that convinced America, convinced the Allies that they had to go nuclear, that the next step was going to have to be the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. Because with those sort of civilian casualties, you wouldn't have been able to take on Japan and without causing probably a million deaths or more. Yeah, it was politically uh, just an impossible thing to commit to. Well, and you couldn't go on taking those sort of casualties in the US military. It was just unacceptable. And I think there was a moral duty of anyone uh, running America to try and cut back on the number of casualties and stop the unnecessary slaughter and bring the war to a premature end. 
And given that the firebombing of Tokyo had cost 100,000 lives, frankly, the casualties that came with Hiroshima and Nagasaki were reduced, were lower than that. But of course, you know, because it was new technology and because it was so dramatic, it has obviously become a very controversial thing. But the other thing to remember, apart from the brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting and the use of flamethrowers and everything else that was going on on Okinawa, you also had over a thousand kamikaze attacks on U.S. ships during that particular campaign. So you can see that the closer you got to Japan, the more ferocious the defence was going to become, the more impossible it was going to be to try and break through without massive casualties. Yeah, and a little side note on that. Um, the Americans lost their most senior general, who was uh, Lieutenant General Buckner, um, at that particular battle when he went to inspect his troops and a Japanese artillery shell landed on some coral nearby, and he was killed by lethal slivers of coral. Yes, I mean, there was so little cover in when you were moving forward or going to forward positions. It was very difficult to escape the sort of counterfire that the Japanese were raining down. It was, it was a terrible campaign, and you know, that was on top of everything else that the Americans had suffered throughout the Pacific or in the, you know, and in the Philippines as well. And MacArthur had lost a lot of men. I mean, a lot of people think that his uh, invasion of the Philippines was just a sort of ego trip and was unnecessary. But all those other campaigns, uh, places like Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima, were, were terrifying and terrible battles. The thing about the Japanese wasn't that they had super sophisticated equipment or even uh, military techniques. It was just that they were so unable to get their head around the idea of surrender. They just would rather die, and every man was going to be his own last stand. Yes, I think only 7,000 surrendered in the end. So you know, if ever there was an example of a higher cause, albeit a somewhat perverse and misguided one, it's really the Japanese stand, last stand on Okinawa. Yeah, there were over 20 Medal of Honor recipients for the Okinawa battle on the American side. OK, Jamie, let's move to military miscalculation or in military slang, FUBAR or SNAFU. That's another one. FUBAR, for those who aren't aware, Second World War military acronym, which stands for, if this is after the nine o'clock uh, watershed, fucked up beyond all recognition. But if you want to keep it clean, you can always say fouled up but beyond all recognition. And for those interested, SNAFU Situation normal, all fucked up. Anyway, so this is where it all goes horribly wrong. So we've got to talk about Custer's last stand. Too right, Tom. It's, it's up there with real military catastrophe. And like the next one we're going to talk about, it's really about commanders who aren't really in control of their brief, don't understand the situation and underestimate the enemy, in this case the Lakota Indians, those tribes were extremely potent. They were rising up against the whole policy of being removed to reservations. These troubles continued for some time, but this was really the epitome of the problem. This was really an example of heavy-handedness and of a commander who had very foolishly had uh, taken his companies of 7th Cavalrymen out uh, into the plains, had split his force, who hadn't brought any Gatling guns along with him. So he was underarmed. And, of course, the Indians at the time did have access to Winchester rifles and, in a lot of cases, were simply taking pot shots from a distance, bringing down Custer's men without having to get into close quarter battle. And they'd managed to assemble a, a large force of 1,500 to 2,500 men. Yes, there were three tribes involved. They, they were basically the Suan tribes, and they were going to get their revenge and going to tr teach the U.S. Army a lesson. I mean, talk about hubris. I think that Custer simply miscalculated on an epic scale, and it caught up with him. You know, all the people from the reservation were really involved. I mean, if you look at the role of women in that battle. 
Um, it's believed that they came up from the villages with blankets to scare the U.S. cavalry horses by waving blankets and making a noise. They carried stone mallets to smash the brains out of those who were wounded, the American soldiers they came across. So everyone was in at the fray, in at the kill. The Battle of Little Bighorn, you know, it's always known for Custer's Last Stand and Last Stand Hill. But actually what happened, it seemed to have been a running battle. There seemed to have been uh, firefights all over the place. And then finally, Custer and several of the companies collected on this small man that wasn't big enough for all of them. And because it was a cavalry unit, you always got soldiers having to hold on to the horses, look after the horses. And it's believed that towards the end of the battle, the soldiers were killing the horses in order to have something to hide behind. Uh, and there was nowhere for the horses to go. I mean, some obviously escaped, some of the soldiers escaped. But by the end of the battle, you've got over 250 dead, over 55 uh, wounded. It was a massacre. It was a total massacre. Uh, but in terms of last stands, again, it has entered legend and folklore. And, it, I mean, it's a little bit like the Charge of the Light Brigade. I mean, Custer and Cardigan have the similarities in their in their sort of style. Well, cavalrymen again. Yeah, but there are a lot of great cavalrymen. Yes, there are. But, but they do need somebody above them to tell them what to do, <laughs> probably. And certainly Not to the, blow it. And certainly in this case. And actually, you know, they have found skeletons, you know, up to 30 of them in a gulch, in a sort of ravine. Um, further a, along from where Custer made his last stand, and they think that might have been the actual last stand where the last remnants were mopped up yeah. by the natives and, and killed. And there were sort of Indian trackers among the cavalry uh, from different tribes who were, were killed among them. So it's sort of hideous running battle with them being sort of sliced down. Well, yes, just like the next battle we're going to talk about, which is Isandwana during the Zulu Wars. Yeah. Three years later, 1879, you get a similar situation. This time it's Lord Chelmsford, and he ends up splitting his force in enemy territory again, one of the complete no-nos uh, that any military commander should be taught. But he ignores that, again, underestimates the enemy, uh, who is basically catch away. And the, the Brits are roaming around uh, Zulu terrain, Zululand, and uh, heading for Lundi, the royal kraal, uh, to teach the Zulus a lesson. And because Charles would split his force, you end up with 1,800 men um, up against 20,000 Zulus. And we all know what happened. I mean, on the face of it, the uh, British had the advantage. I mean, they had Martini Henry rifles and the Zulus had Asagai spears. Yes, but they hadn't really factored in the fighting abilities of the Zulu, you know, the famous horns of the bull, the fact that the Zulus were essentially going to outflank and outmaneuver the Brits, who are in a static position. They hadn't put in stakes, they hadn't built any outer defences, they were in a temporary camp. And so they were essentially producing a, a lines of soldiers, the old uh, British fighting square, but they weren't squares, they were basically... Uh, companies of soldiers um, trying to defend a fairly large front and stop being outflanked. And the Zulu simply sent the horns of the bull around the side. And so what happened is the Brits were essentially retreating inwards and inwards towards the camp. And yes, the British had the Martini Henry rifle, but and it was effective. I mean, it was a very powerful gun, but rounds tend to cook off after you've used it a while it tended to jam and if you have gaps of sort of three feet either side between soldiers if one of the guns jams or one of the soldiers is shot you've then got six to eight feet of space through which a Zulu can run and once the Zulus were in the camp had had managed to outflank or penetrate the British line you had a free-for-all, and it became just like uh, Custer's Last Stand, uh, the Battle of the Greasy Grass, as it's called by the Lakota Indians in those days. The Exactly the same happened uh, at Isandwana. You had small groups of people 
uh, really fighting against vast numbers of Zulu impi. And so in close quarter, it comes down to uh, the Zulu shield and stabbing spear against a bayonet. It's very difficult to to sort of really have the flexibility to guard against three or four Zulu coming at you at the same time. So you could either be stabbed or you could have your brains dashed out with a knob carry. It was a, it was a very brutal hand-to-hand battle. And the Zulus at one stage were picking up bodies and throwing themselves onto the British bayonets in order to lower the British guns so they could get a stab in. Yeah, incredible. It's extraordinary how the tactic of the horns of the the bull or the buffalo are um, so sort of similar to other periods of time, like Hannibal at the Battle of Cannae. Um, He does a sort of similar technique of a a flanking movement on either side and letting the middle sort of slightly give way. It's it's always the way of the outflanking manoeuvre. You know, it's always you have your best troops quite often uh, on the flank, who can encircle. You had your flexible, your most flexible groups on on the side. And oddly enough, that's exactly how the Spanish Armada sailed with its best warships, its best galleons on, on the tips. It's a, it's a great manoeuvre, both, both offensively and defensively. It didn't work against Drake and the rest. No, it didn't. Yeah. But by the end of Isandwana, you know, the, the, one of the last stands of Isandwana, were, well, there were two ones that really stand out. One is that uh, s- some of the British soldiers had retreated into a cave and the Zulus by that stage had gathered up some of the rifles and were just firing into the cave and repeatedly fired until the resistance was finished. Um, there was also a great story of a fantastic Irish sergeant, huge man, who was guarding the colours in the tent of Chelmsford, who wasn't there at the time. It was just just the colours. And the, the, the sergeant put up a hell of a fight and was eventually cut down. But you know, you got these actions all round the place. And then, of course, you had a, an eclipse, a solar eclipse in the middle of the battle. You know, both sides talk about it, uh, including the Zulu. And, and it was astonishing how you know, once the sun came out again, by that stage, the Zulu were in and among the camp and all the tents were being cut down and the people inside them killed and the people defending them were killed. It, so it was so sort of seen problem. as a good portent for the, for the Zulus. Well, maybe, the, yeah. maybe. And, and some people managed to slip away. I mean, the Zulu were not intending to take any prisoners. And the only thing they had been told was, was don't kill the civilians. And maybe they could be used as hostages. So some of the more senior British officers there who were wearing dark clothing and frock coats were mistaken as civilians and actually sort of let off, survived. Uh, Then, of course, there was the famous dash. One of the most dramatic actions, and it came towards the end of the battle, was when Lieutenants Melville and Coghill tried to save the colours and galloped towards Buffalo River. But I think they got across the river and were then killed and the colours taken. So it was pretty tragic. And it wasn't actually until 1907 they were awarded posthumous Victoria Crosses because there was always a bit of controversy. Should they have stayed with their men at the 24th foot or should they have saved the colours? It was a conundrum, but they were you know, very brave to have tried to save the colours, which is so important to any regiment. So, yeah, the families petitioned um, the, even the Queen, Queen Victoria, but it was only in 1907, after the Queen had uh, already died, that they were given a posthumous award of the Victoria Cross, and they were one of the first soldiers to receive that medal, which to this day can still be awarded to men who die in battle. Yes, it's amazing that uh, Edward VII was the king on the throne when they eventually received the VC, but it's, uh, it's an amazing story. And Isandwana, from that battle, came extraordinary tales of heroism and defiance. And then the next day, uh, we have the famous battle at Rourke's Drift, really skirmish at Rourke's Drift. But um, what happened there, Jamie? 22nd to 23rd January, Rourke's Drift. It was the most amazing battle, most incredible defence. And it's been immortalised in movies. 
the only massacre that really occurred, I have to say, was probably to the upper-class English accent by Michael Caine in the film Zulu. Lines like, are you making mud pies down there? But I think he'd probably recognise that himself. But the battle itself was quite extraordinary. There were about 139 British troops, 11 colonials, uh, a troop of 100 uh, Natal horsemen had uh, arrived and then ridden off uh, they they knew that things were going to turn bad and also I don't think horsemen would have added anything to the battle the defence ended up um, behind mealy sacks behind, behind biscuit tins the Zulis got onto the roof and set fire to the hospital section by the end of the battle the following day there were 17 British dead, there were 11 Victoria Crosses or one in the defence. So you can see this, the level of intensity. The Zulu having won at Isandwana and also now carrying uh, the Martini Henry rifle and deploying it against the defenders of Rourke's Drift were probably attacking in the belief that it was going to be an easy win. I mean, they had won at Isandwana. Why should they not win at Rourke's Drift? But they were up against a concerted and disciplined defence, and it just shows what you can do from a well-defended position uh, if you know that there's no way out. So Rourke's Drift doesn't really come into our last stand section because they essentially survived and the mission was defended and succeeded and also it, was, it gave the pol politicians back home an opportunity to, to divert the public's interest from the disaster of the of the battle the day before and make heroes of these uh, these brave men uh, who'd survived the encounter the next day yes and you can also see some of the controversy surrounding the award of Victoria Crosses that there, 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 there was always going to be a bit of aggro a bit of envy some of the senior officers were incredibly spiteful about Bromhead and Chard, who were the two lieutenants in charge. And you can see from the comments of his contemporaries and senior officers what some of them thought about Chard. Yeah, I, yeah General Sir Garnet Wolseley thought that the desperate defence of Rourke's Drift were rats fighting for their lives, which could not otherwise save. And he presented Chard with his VC on the 16th of July... He subsequently said of Chard that a more uninteresting, a more stupid-looking fellow I never saw. So, sorry, Stanley Baker. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> just deeply unpleasant. <laughs> you don't want to hear that from your, your senior officer. No. But, uh, poor old Chard, he smoked his pipe for too long and his, his tongue went, <laughs> went fell off. <laughs> I think they had to cut it out. Yeah, oh, yeah. So it's but they, 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 they say he could still speak, so I dread to think... Yes, what he sounded like before. Yeah. Well, yes, or afterwards. And I think poor old Bromhead died in India uh, some years later, age 45. But you know, this is the sort of thing that happens in corners of empire and colonies. You know, there, there are so many corners of foreign fields that are littered with the bodies of soldiers. Those soldiers have either died from disease or they've died from bullets and assegais. In fact, Lord Moynihan's ancestor who was a Moynihan who fought at Crimea, he won the Victoria Cross and he then died from drinking milk on his way home when he was on Malta. So anything can happen when you're abroad. So it's better to go out in a blaze of glory. I think it probably is. At least you don't get your tongue cut off. But it is kind of interesting that so often these small groups, uh, because the uh, the countries the countries like Britain, the British Empire, didn't really want to spend much money defending their various possessions around the world. But these small groups kind of got caught with their trousers down and didn't do so well sometimes. But then on other occasions, if they stuck to the way that they were trained, they could be incredibly effective, just a small number of them just sticking to the way that they were trained and the tactics that they were trained to use. Yes, and you know, if you're up against an irregular force as well, if you're well-trained and you're disciplined and you can pick out the enemy, then you've got a fair chance, a fighting chance, of putting up a successful defence. And that really leads us to our third and last section, which I suppose we can call No Way Out. And these are really the small unit actions that infest the whole timeline of history and certainly of empires abroad, because th these are where small groups wiped out 
uh, or put up a last stand and do incredible things. Yeah, well, I mean, as an example of that would be the defence of the magazine at Delhi in uh, 11th of May, 1857. Yes, and that was when the Indian mutiny broke out and there were massacres going on all around the place and there were a group of British soldiers who simply didn't want the magazine to fall into the hands of the mutineers. They knew that that magazine contained enough weapons and ordnance to equip an entire army. So they decided, once the mutinous sepoys started attacking, they knew that their role was to blow up the magazine and ensure it didn't fall into the hands of the enemy. And that's what they did. They blew it up. There was a massive explosion. It's said that it was one of the largest explosions ever seen in history. And it could be heard at Meerut, 40 miles away, And in fact, Buckley, the young officer there, was blown out of the magazine into the river near Bybad. He was completely blackened. His clothes were ripped to shreds. But he actually survived. He was told that his wife was dead and his children had been slaughtered. And his captors thought he was such a hero. They kept him alive and he actually escaped and made it to British lines, back to British lines. So he was... He was saved. He got a Victoria Cross. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, that's something I didn't know. <laughs> Major John Buckley, VC. I, he kind of reminds me of that bit in the in the Naked Gun movie where the doctor is trying to trying to put a pillow over the patient's head and he has to escape from the scene and he's been chased by uh, Lieutenant Drebert, is he called? What's the the character anyway and, and he goes along and he he keeps kind of crashing into oil tankers and it's exploding then he finds himself sitting on an on an army missile and that blows up and eventually he goes into a chinese fireworks <laughs> a building and that blows up as well and he's still alive yeah but how this guy got out i do not know i know it's, it's, there, it's, it's, there was another guy called willoughby who was actually the senior lieutenant there and he was the one who gave the order to blow up the magazine And he survived too. It's just remarkable that anyone came out of this explosion alive, if you think that it was heard 40 miles away. It was just huge. But he tried to escape later from his captors and was killed two days later as he was trying to get to Marut. So he he didn't make it. But uh, it was the most amazing and defiant last stand. We have a famous action with uh, Sikhs, 21 Sikhs, 12th of September, 1897. Yes, at Saragari in Afghanistan. And these 21 Sikhs, they weren't even well armed because of Indian mutiny. The Brits were concerned that Indian soldiers, Indian sepoys, would misuse, um, misdirect their modern weaponry. So they were given old rifles. And these 21 Sikhs were essentially guarding a signals post. It wasn't considered particularly important. But And they ended up being attacked by 10,000 uh, Pushtun tribesmen and, and ended up killing over 1,000 of them. And this was at the same time that uh, someone else we've mentioned in another podcast, Brigadier General Henry Brooke, took over command at Kandahar and he was besieged there and eventually shot through the head. But I remember his diaries, talks of uh, travelling up from India to Kandahar and passing... Um, a British outpost that had been raided by Pushkin tribesmen and he talks of the body of a British sergeant lying there and in front of this British sergeant are about a dozen Afghans drilled through the head by the sergeant's marksmanship. So these small unit actions were occurring all over the place and Sarigari was just one of them but it was the most phenomenal battle The Pushtuns charged the gate twice. They managed to knock down part of the wall and charge up. They eventually got in, and it was a fight to the last. The final Sikh to be killed uh, in those final stages uh, managed to kill 40 Pushtun tribesmen, and they must have used everything. They must have clawed the faces off by the end and used everything from their rifle butts to their bayonets. It was the most amazing action and totally heroic. Uh, but it's interesting that I don't think those Sikhs were actually uh, given medals. Another thing we should consider, when just looking back on Custer's last stand, was from the Indian side and the massacres that went on that no doubt encouraged them to fight. 
there were massacres on all sides. So, and there was the famous Camp Grant massacre in 1871, April 1871, when a group of Americans and American Mexicans and rival tribes to the Apaches attacked the Apache camp and massacred 144. What's interesting about that episode is that the Apache tribe, the men, were out hunting. And so all but eight of the corpses that were later found were actually belonged to women and children. And there were over 20 um, women and children who were taken and sold into slavery down in Mexico. So those were the sort of actions that were going on at that time. So, And this was after the American Civil War, a lot of men, ex-soldiers, and there was a bounty on, on killing Indians, wasn't there? Yes, yeah, and people were moving westwards. People were looking for farming land, grazing land. People were heading uh, towards the west. And there was a lot of friction, a lot of confrontation. Yeah. You, know, you got that a few years later at Custer's Last Stand, so you can see what was going on. You can see the, the use of irregulars, the use of the military as well. And on both sides, you got attacks. And you know, all those corpses... Uh, found at Camp Grant had been scalped. I mean, it was it was barbaric. Yeah, but, but what that was, going was the, on. that was the way they were paid. I mean, wasn't it that you had to produce a scalp to get paid? Yes, you have to somehow identify the opposition that you've killed, and you, know, you can see that during the Malayan emergency in the 1950s or the Borneo confrontation in the 1960s, where you know, the Brits used Iban headhunters to cut the heads off. Uh, the people they had killed, whether they were communist insurgents or the Indonesians in the Borneo confrontation, um, and take them back to be identified. So it's it's common currency, really. And, and I suppose if they shrunk the heads, they could put more in their backpacks, could they? You were ever practical, Tom. <laughs> Sadly, the shrunken heads in the Pitt Rivers Museum have been put away in a cupboard. Yes, they're so... Not on display anymore. Not even outside a longhouse somewhere in Borneo. I think we should free the shrunken heads. We yeah. should start a petition. <laughs> Why not? There were last stands and atrocities all over the place. We remember the ones that stand out, but many have just faded into the past that we never hear about anymore. Yeah, I'm just uh, reading the first of Robert Caro's books on uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, he describes the times in the Texas Hill Country in the days of uh, LBJ's uh, grandparents, where there was still, you know, Comanche and um, Indians ranging far and wide. And, and when they captured the uh, isolated farmers and uh, their wives, I mean, the farmers were probably killed in the most gruesome way, but the, the wives would be taken off, scalped, not killed, and then sort of kept as as sort of prisoners and tortured, you know, they were raped, and uh, they heated up their tomahawks and pressed them to the top of the women's heads. And, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no bounds to the imagination of torture that they managed to come up with. Human beings, wonderful creatures. We love them. That just about wraps up Nowhere to Run. But like the other sections that we've talked about, it, it really involves people with their backs to the wall putting up a last stand and ultimately you do it whether it's for a higher cause or because you know what's going to happen to you. Uh, you know, as at Little Bighorn, I mean, I think the cavalrymen of the 7th, 7th Cavalry uh, knew what was coming. They knew that they wouldn't be spared. At Isandwana, uh, the men of the 24th foot knew that they wouldn't be spared by the Zulus. So you might as well go out fighting. And you didn't want to be spared because you knew you would be tortured to death in the most hideous fashion. Yes, you might as well go for it at the last moments and put up a fight. OK, Jamie. Well, we've got to have a little PS before we sign off. So what is it going to be? Well, I thought we'd go maritime for this one. And we've already done the little revenge the uh, flagship of Drake under the command of Sir Richard Grenville uh, fighting off the Spanish in the Azores. So we'll do something different and we'll go for the massive battleship, the Yamoto, full displacement of 71,000 tonnes. Probably the greatest suicide mission, the greatest kamikaze mission ever mounted. 
This was the 6th of April, 1945, when she set out from Japan with seven escort destroyers to raid the American fleet that was attacking Okinawa and destroy the amphibious landings there. So she set out, and the following day she was tracked by two American submarines. But there was no air cover. The Japanese had no aircraft carriers by that stage. So she was basically on her own with her escort ships. She had on board 150 anti-aircraft guns along with her main armament. But she was no match for the Avenger torpedo carrying aircraft and the hell divers, the dive bombers that the Americans sent against her with their armor-piercing bombs. And the Americans very cleverly attacked her port side, so you know, the water would rush in through one side and capsize her. And that essentially is what happened. On the 7th, she was repeatedly attacked. I mean, at one time, she was hit by eight torpedoes and 15 armor-piercing bombs. There were fires throughout the ship, and she started to list. The ship didn't actually carry uh, life rafts or lifeboats because this was seen as dishonorable, and it was, uh, of course, a kamikaze mission. As the ship started to capsize, the admiral locked himself in his flag cabin and the captain tied himself to the binnacle. The ship capsized and over 4,000 crew were drowned. It was the most horrendous end. Uh, and you know that in itself is the sign of a really good famous last stand. The Yamoto stands out as one of the craziest Uh, expeditions ever mounted by the Japanese but you can see from the other kamikaze attacks on the Americans at that stage quite how desperate the Japanese were but they had run out of options by that stage and like so many last stands that is the result of military incompetence or simply a misreading of the situation or of course just nowhere to run. Oh, enough, Jamie, or I'll end up blubbing like the menfolk in that movie Sleepless in Seattle when they talk about the last stand at Rose Creek by the Magnificent Seven. I think we have to play out with another verse from Macaulay's Horatius, who has by now valiantly defended Rome against the Etruscan invader to give the city fathers time to destroy the bridge into the city. He plunges to his apparent death. O Tiber, Father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, a Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking sheathed the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back, plunged headlong in the tide. By the way, he survives. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Tom. So it goes. My name is Tom Ashton. His name is James Jackson. You can view images relating to each podcast on our Bloody Violent History Instagram account and on our website, bloodyviolenthistory.com. Please subscribe, it's free, to our podcast on the app you use and to our mailing list via our website. This is very important as it boosts our rankings in the podcast charts. Thank you and good luck. Thank you.